Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. So today's case, um, it's definitely a case that divides opinions. We are going to be talking about the case of Jay Janks. And if you know about this case, you'll know why I say it divides opinions. Because Jay Janks, she was a woman in her thirties. She was living in California. She had a very successful business. She was living her best life. But then one day when she was visiting her stepdad, who was an elderly man, he had a lot of health issues and she was kind of like his carer. So she went over to her stepdad's house and she was doing some cleaning. She went over to his computer and she accidentally knocked the mouse on the computer and the computer screen lit up. And the screensaver on the PC was an indecent image. Let's just say that. Now this completely shocked Jade, but then when she realized what the image was actually of, her world just completely shattered. And the situation on the computer, it was a lot worse than she could have ever imagined. And she was very angry and she wanted revenge. And she went about it in the most brutal way possible. And this case also happened in 2020. So this is definitely the most recent case I have ever covered. So anyway, we have a lot of uh, things to get into today. So let's jump in. I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor. And that is Love and Pies. Love and Pies is a free to download mobile game where you play a single mom, Amelia Green, who is trying to restore a family cafe and build a thriving business. And this game, as you guys know by now, I absolutely love this game game so much. It is the best game discovery I have made in 2023 and that is a very bold statement but I will stand by it and I know so many of you are also obsessed with this game. I see so many comments from you guys saying oh my god thank you so much for introducing me to Love and Pies. It's so good. I'm so obsessed. I just feel like we have our own little Love and Pies community here and if you don't play Love and Pies you really are missing out because it's such a good game. It is perfect for all of us mystery true crime fans here. Amelia is trying to figure out who burned down the family cafe? Where has her mom gone? Who is the purple fox? Everyone is a suspect. And right now, Amelia is kind of going around everyone in the game and interviewing them and trying to figure out, was it you? Did you burn down the family cafe? It's all very dramatic. It's all very fun. And you get to bake along the way. I have one order right now that wants the ultimate hot chocolate. And oh my God, it is taking me forever. And also in their order, they want a deluxe cocoa as well. So again, they want that and the Ultima hot chocolate. And there is also some exciting news because Love and Pies are celebrating their second birthday. I know, I cannot believe that Love and Pies is only two years old because it's such an amazing game. And over the next two weeks, there are going to be a ton of celebrations, including new events, new storylines. In fact, if you play the game in the next two weeks, you will get this adorable birthday cake statue. And then on top of all of that, Love and Pies are also going to be hosting a ton of events on their socials, including the bake out birthday bash where everyone will have the chance at winning amazing prizes by baking the very cakes in love and pies which i love baking i do but i am not that skilled to try and bake one of the cakes from love and pies i mean these are the brownies that i recently made and they tasted nice okay but they don't look the best okay so my baking skills are about a level one but if you're good at baking and you can make one of the cakes from love and pies you should enter because you could win an amazing prize but anyway, there's just loads going on with Love and Pies. So there has never been a better time to play Love and Pies than right now. And if you wanted to check out Love and Pies for yourself, you can download the game for free by using the link in my description box. And by using that link in the description box, rather than going to the app store, it really does help out this channel. So I just want to give a huge thank you to Love and Pies for sponsoring today's video. But thank you to every single one of you guys watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Jay Jenks was born on the 14th of October 1983, making her a Libra. And she was born to parents Jeanette and Steve Jenks. And pretty much from the get-go in Jade's life, there was chaos. Because when she was just three months old, her parents got divorced. Her mom had a lot of struggles with substances. She did have a drug and alcohol addiction. And unfortunately for Jeanette, this drug and alcohol addiction, it came before 
for everybody else, including her daughter Jade. And she just was not in the right place to be raising a child. So Jade's dad, Steve, decided that he was going to divorce Jeanette and take Jade with him and raise Jade as a single parent. So Jade's dad found a new place in San Diego, California, which is actually where the rest of today's case takes place. But then even though there was that bit of chaos in Jade's early life, from this moment on, as far as I can tell from my research, Jade had a pretty great childhood. She grew up in Southern California. She had a real good group of friends. She did well at school. She always got good grades. She really got on with her dad as well. She was definitely a daddy's girl. Her dad started his own construction company, which was very successful. However, when it came to the relationship with Jade's mom, that was pretty much non-existent. Her mom still had visitation rights on the weekend, so Jade did still see her mom quite often, but there was never really a relationship there. Jade's mom continued to have her struggles with drugs and alcohol, and she just was not a reliable parent. And there would even be times when Jade was supposed to see her mom on the weekends and her mom just wouldn't turn up. And slowly as the years rolled by, Jade's mom just stopped turning up. The relationship just completely dwindled and in the end, Jade actually stopped seeing her mom altogether. So as the years go by, Jade is now a teenager. So she is at high school, she's thriving, she's not really having much contact with her mom. But then when she's 14, all of a sudden, out out of the blue, she got a phone call from her mom. And Jade picked up the phone. She was like, wow, I haven't heard from my mom in a very long time. I wonder what she wants. So Jade picks up the phone to her mom and her mom just so casually says, oh, hi, Jade, just want to let you know, I've got a married, yeah, sorry for not inviting you. Oh, and I'm pregnant. You're going to have a little baby brother. Can you imagine receiving a phone call like that when you haven't seen your mom in a very long time and all of a sudden she's married and she's pregnant? As a 14-year-old, that would probably hit you like a ton of bricks. And after this phone call, this is when Jade and her mom, they start to reconnect because Jade, even though she hadn't seen her mom in so long and her mom has never Never really there for her, Jade was really excited about having a brother. She was probably also excited about the thought of having her mom back in her life again because her mom, it did kind of seem like she got her act together. So Jade goes over to visit her mom for the first time in a very, very long time. And this is also the first time that she would meet her new stepdad, a man named Tom Merriman, a man who is very significant to today's case. So Tom Merriman was born on the 2nd of June, 1956. And at the time he met Jade, so the time that he became Jade's stepfather, he was currently 41 years old. Now Tom has been described as a very kind, very generous man. He loved nature, he loved being outdoors and he loved gardening. And he was very much a handyman. He was just one of those people that you could phone up and he kind of knew a little bit about everything. And prior to meeting Jade's mom, Tom had been in a previous relationship and he did have a child from that relationship. And to be honest, I don't know anything about this child. Like, I don't know if Tom saw his child a lot. Like, I don't really know. So there's not really much to say. So Tom was now 41. He had just gotten married to Jade's mom, Jeanette. They had a very whirlwind relationship. They got married very quickly. And Jeanette was obviously pregnant. She gave birth to a boy and they named the boy Cash. And Jade's mom really wanted Jade to be a part of their little family. She wanted to be a family of four. So Jade, she still lived with her biological father, but she would go over to her mom's a lot. And the birth of Cash really did bring everyone together. Jade loved being an older sister. She loved looking after Cash as much as she could. However, there was kind of a problem with this new family setup, like this new family of four, was that Jade didn't really get get on with her new stepdad, Tom. She didn't really dislike him, but she didn't like him. She kind of felt like Tom was just a bit weird. Jade has said that Tom was a little bit socially awkward, so it was kind of hard to have a conversation with him. Like, he didn't really do small talk very well, and he didn't, like, pick up on, like, normal social cues. And Jade, as a 14-year-old, because you've got to remember she's only 14, she doesn't really know how to talk to Tom. She doesn't really know how to be around him. So she doesn't dislike him, 
but she doesn't like him at the same time. Does that make sense? And Jade would just kind of avoid being around him, especially on her own, because whenever she was with Tom on her own, there would just be silence. Neither one of them knew how to talk to one another. It was just silent. It was just awkward. And things stay like this for the next few years. So Jade is 14. She then turns 15, 16. This is probably the point in Jade's life where everything was great. She was a daddy's girl. She loved living with her dad, but she was now also reconnected with her mom. She had a younger brother that she absolutely adored. She had really good friends. She was getting good grades. Like literally picture perfect life. However, it was when Jay turned 18 that everything changed. And this is when everything started to go south in her mom and Tom's relationship. So we all know that Jade's mom, she did have a little bit of a drug and alcohol addiction. But so far for those like four years, she had completely stayed sober and everything was going well in Jeanette's life. However, Jade's mom relapsed. She started drinking heavily again, dabbling in drugs and her past personality just completely changed. She was now a very angry, violent person. Jeanette and Tom would constantly be getting into arguments with one another. They would both accuse one another of being physically abusive to the other. Sometimes their arguments would end in physical fights. They actually separated on a number of occasions and filed for divorce on three separate occasions. But on all of the occasions, they ended up getting back together. And Jade, she was quite often at the house when these physical fights broke out. So she kind of felt like she was in the middle of everything. And Jade's priority was her little brother, Cash. Jade didn't want her little brother exposed to all of this. And Jade could quite clearly see that it was her mom that was the problem. It was her mom that had completely relapsed. It was her mom that was always starting the argument, starting the fights. So because it was Jade's mom that was the problem, this made Jade and Tom, her stepdad, grow close closer because Jade was actually on Tom's side. Whenever an argument would break out, Jade would always back up Tom. And over the months, Jade and Tom started to confide in each other. I think both Tom and Jade were really hoping that Jeanette would clean up again and she would get her act together, but she never did. So both Jade and Tom are becoming increasingly concerned about Cash. And then eventually the time came where Cash was going to attend kindergarten. And he was so excited about this. He was literally telling everyone that he could. However, when it came to his first day at kindergarten, Cash woke up that morning. He was so excited. He got all ready to go. He got his little backpack and he was waiting for his mom to take him to kindergarten. But his mom never woke up. The night prior, she had gone on a drink and drug binge and she had stumbled in, gone to bed and she never woke up. And Tom, his job, he left really early in the morning. So Tom wasn't around either to take him. And poor little Cash was just stuck in the house and he missed his first day. And my heart just breaks for him because he was so, so excited and he was just left abandoned in the house. And when Jade and Tom learn about this, this was the last straw because it was quite clear that Jeanette didn't really care about Cash at the moment. So at the age of 18, Jade offered to step up. She decided to leave her biological dad's home and move in with her mom, Tom and Cash. Now this was a huge sacrifice to Jade because she's only 18 years old, but she has decided to step up and be a parent to Cash. Jade wanted to live with the family so she could help parent Cash, that she could protect him, shield him from his mom. And also if Jade was living with them, Cash would never miss a day of kindergarten. So this is what happened. Jade moved in with the family. She enrolled in a local college. And again, Jade and Tom were really hoping that Jeanette would clean up. Surely she's going to clean up at some point. However, Jeanette doesn't change. She carries on with her binges and her behavior just gets worse and worse and worse. And things escalated so much that one day Jeanette actually got arrested and she was sent to prison. Now I'm not sure on what charges. I assume it was kind of like drug related charges, but I, I just don't know. And once Jeanette had gone to prison, this truly was the last straw for Tom and Jade. They had to act. They couldn't just sit around anymore and wait for Jeanette to change. So whilst Jeanette was in prison, Tom and Jade packed up all of their belongings and they moved out. They found a new place and they took cash with them. So now going forward, it was Tom, 
Jade and Cash. They were now living together. Tom was currently 45 years old. Jade was still 18 and Cash was currently four years old. And Jade and Tom now shared the responsibility for Cash between them. And from this point forward, everything is now great because the problem was Jeanette. But now Jeanette is no longer in the picture. Jeanette does eventually get out of prison, but she doesn't move back in with the family. So Jeanette is now out of the picture for right now. And Jade and Tom, they become so close like even closer than they were before. Tom starts calling Jade his daughter and Jade also started calling Tom her dad. And then eventually Jade does graduate from college and she starts working for her biological dad because he has a very successful construction company and she starts working for him. She starts doing the books and everything. However, as soon as Jade starts to work for her biological dad and starts spending a lot more time around her biological dad's Steve. This is when uh, Jade and Tom's relationship kind of went south. Tom definitely got jealous of Jade's biological father. Tom didn't like that Jade was actually close to her biological dad. Tom wanted to be Jade's only dad. He was insanely jealous. He saw Jade as his daughter and his daughter alone. And he would just start to make all of these little snidey comments about Jade's biological dad. He started to become very manipulative. He was trying to turn Jade against her dad. And Tom started trying to spend as much time around Jade as possible. And he started to become very demanding of Jade. He expected Jade to do everything around the house, all of the cooking, all of the cleaning, all of the parenting to cash. And I think that that was kind of like a tactic from Tom to keep Jade in the house, keep Jade around for as long as possible. And it got to a point where Jade had just had enough. She didn't want to deal with her stepdad, Tom, anymore. Their relationship had definitely soured. And Jade was currently 23 years old and she just wanted her own space and she decided to move out. Now, when she did this, Tom was absolutely heartbroken. And over the the next few months, Tom really tried to stay in contact with Jade. He would always be calling her and messaging her, but Jade didn't ever pick up the phone. Now, Jade would still occasionally go over to the house because, of course, she wanted to see her younger brother and she would always make sure that she would go over on birthdays and holidays. But for the most part, Jade just kind of stayed away. And Jade and Tom's relationship, they became just more and more distant. And it was around this time as well where Jade's mom, Jeanette, pops back up. She had cleaned herself back up again and Jeanette now wanted full custody of Cash. And she got full custody, so Jeanette took Cash and left. So now Tom, in a very short space of time, he went from living with his son Cash and also Jade and they were living together as a family of three for about five years. So that is a very long time. And then all of a sudden, Jade moves out and now Cash has been taken from him. So now all of a sudden, Tom is living alone. And now that Cash has also gone, Jade no longer has any reason to ever go over to Tom's house ever again. And Tom fell into a very deep depression. He was incredibly lonely and his life kind of just spiraled. But when Tom's life is falling apart, Jade's life actually starts to thrive because she was working with her dad at the construction company. And it was when she was working at this construction company that she realized that she loved design. So at the age of 25, Jade left her dad's company and decided to set up her own business. And she went into interior design. She set up her own business called Janks Interiors. And 10 years passed by and her business absolutely soars. And it became very well known in the local area. And it actually states on Google that Jade Janks had a net worth of $15 million. So that is how good Janks Interiors is doing as a business. And I don't know how true that is because obviously that is a lot of money. That is just what I found on Google. And as you can imagine, and Jade is in her mid thirties at this point. She has a very successful business. She has a lot of money. She has a lot of friends. Her life couldn't be much better. And then we get to April of 2020. And this is when Jade is 37 years old. And this is when something very significant would happen because this is when Jade would reconnect with her stepdad, Tom, and everything would soon spiral downwards 
from here. In April of 2020, Jade moves to a new home located on South Nardo Avenue in Salona Beach, which is just outside of San Diego. And guess who just so happened to live on the exact same street? Her old stepdad, Tom Merriman. He lived at 144 and Jade moved to 148. And you know, I go on Google Maps, I like to scope out the place. And I couldn't believe that they're basically next door neighbors. They even share like a, like a drive. So over those 10 years, they hadn't seen each other for like 10 years. So that is a very long time. So over those 10 years, Tom had really rebuilt his life because the last time we had heard from him, he was struggling. He was suffering with depression, but he climbed out of that depression in 2013, he actually opened up his own business, which was a non-profit butterfly farm. I know, pretty random. And this was both a research and an education center. And from my understanding, it was very successful. Like it was very well known in the local area. So Tom is now 64 years old and Jade is 37. It was almost like fate brought these two back together. At this point, both Jade and Tom were living alone. And because they were neighbors, they they reconnected. They started speaking to one another and going over to each other's homes. It actually started to become a regular thing that Tom would go over to Jade's house once a week for dinner. And they soon became very good friends again. They did almost have that father-daughter relationship again. And they had a lot of history. They had been through so much together. So they did have a pretty special bond. And Jade has actually said that she trusted no one in the world more than Tom. Tom would also message Jade and say things like, no one in the world will love you as much as I do, which sounds quite sweet when you hear that. But then when you know what happens in this case, that takes a very sinister meaning and it definitely creeps you out a little bit. However, there was one thing that soon kind of became a problem and that was Tom's health. Now he was in his late 60s and it had been a while since Jade had seen him and his health had deteriorated quite a lot. He had built up a number of medical conditions and he had quite a lot. I have them written down here because I cannot remember them all. Um, he had liver dysfunction, a pacemaker, an enlarged heart, congestive heart failure, swollen and congested lungs, emphysema from prolonged smoking, 30 to 40% blockage of his arteries. And I swear there was actually a few more, but there was just a lot that he had, okay? He was really struggling. His health just was declining more and more. And Tom just didn't know how to handle this. And he turned to alcohol and also Xanax to deal with with his problems and he soon developed an addiction, especially to Xanax. And then Jade appeared back in his life. And obviously this was really good news for Tom. However, he was still really struggling and Jade, she was that kind of daughter-like person to him. She almost did pick up where she left off and she became a caregiver to Tom. And this all happened within six months of Jade moving next door to him. She did become his full-time caregiver. She would cook all of his meals. She would clean his house, pick up his prescription, take him to doctor's appointments to the hospital. She would spend as much time as she possibly could with him to keep him company. And Jade didn't mind at all because she had realized that Tom, he was like a father to her. She wanted to help him. However, as much as Jade was enjoying all of this, this would all soon change because Jade was about to make a very shocking discovery. And uh, it's definitely a discovery that will send a shiver down your spine and it will creep you out. So we now get to December 2020, approximately eight months since Jade has moved in next door to Tom. So in mid-December, Jade took a trip to Cabo, Mexico, and she went to Cabo with one of her ex-boyfriends that she had recently reconnected with, who is a man called Adam. Now they went on this trip to Cabo just as friends, nothing more, even though Adam was hoping that it would turn into something more. Adam was apparently hoping to get lucky. It didn't happen though. And remember Adam because he comes back up in this case. Yes, yeah, so don't forget him. However, whilst Jade is in Mexico, she receives quite a distressing call from Tom. And on the phone, Tom is slurring his words. He's not really making much sense. Jade is trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Tom just kept saying over and over again, they beat me up. They beat me up. And Jade was like, what the hell do you mean? Who beat you up? What 
is going on? And Tom sent Jade a picture of like a load of bloody tissues and bloody towels. And Jade was becoming really concerned because she was like, what do you mean someone's beat you up? You're bleeding, what is wrong? However, after calming Tom down and actually getting to the bottom of what was going on, Jade realized that Tom had actually just been drinking and he had gotten so drunk that he had fallen over and hurt himself. So Jade was just like, Tom, get some rest, recover, don't drink too much, please. A few days go by and Tom phones Jade again. He tells Jade that he's had another fall and he thinks that he's broken his ribs. And Jade is like, oh my God, like, is he being serious? Like, she doesn't know if she can trust him. Is he drunk on the phone? Is he actually making sense? But Jade was pretty concerned about him because even if he hasn't broken his ribs, he's clearly drinking too much. He's frail, he's on his own, his health is not good. So from Mexico, Jade phones paramedics. And when the paramedics got to the home, they do confirm that he has broken ribs. But also he is going through Xanax withdrawal. So they decide to take Tom in to hospital to help him recover from the broken ribs, help him get through this Xanax withdrawal. And he was going to be in hospital for the next couple of weeks. So Jade returns from vacation. And the first thing that she wants to do is go and visit Tom in the hospital. And when she got there, he did not look good. And Tom is going to be in hospital for approximately another week. And Jade wants to do something nice for Tom. She wants to clean his home from top to bottom. So it's sparkling. So when he gets home from the hospital, he comes home to a nice clean home. And this is where everything starts to go terribly wrong. Because it is now the 23rd of December 2020. And this is the day that the shocking revelations get revealed. So we obviously know that Jade has just visited Tom in the hospital. And on the 23rd of December, this is when she's going to go over to his home and clean everything. So she goes over to the house. And I just want to point out that she's cleaned his house many times before. So this is not unusual, but she wants to give the house a deep clean. So she's over at Tom's home. She's deep cleaning everything. She's going to the kitchen. She's pulling everything out of the kitchen cupboard. She is doing a real deep clean. And then she gets to Tom's office, which is a room that she's never actually entered before because Tom, he's pretty private. He likes his privacy. And this office is where he does all his work. And it's where Tom likes to have his alone time. And Jade has always respected that. So she's never gone in. However, this time she thought, I want to clean it. It probably hasn't been cleaned in years. It's probably filthy in there. I want to go in, clean it. He'll be happy about that. So she ventures into the office. She's cleaning around, dusting, and it is a right state. And then she gets to the desk and she's dusting around the computer. She's moving things around and she accidentally bumps into the mouse of the PC. And the PC was asleep, but she bumps into the mouse and wakes up the computer. And Tom's screensaver appeared and Jade's jaw hit the ground. She could not believe what she was seeing. Because you know, this screensaver, it wasn't your usual screensaver. You know the usual stock pictures of mountains or trees or the ocean or like weird moving like circle blob things? No, no, no. This screensaver was none of that. Tom's screensaver was a large zoomed in picture of a woman's breasts. Yeah, you heard that right. Just the breasts on the screen. Nothing else, just the breasts. And Jay was like, it's a bit weird. Like, really? Like, as the screensaver? But then she does a double take and her whole world shatters. Her brain has finally fully processed the screensaver, the picture, the breasts, everything. Her brain has finally caught up and she's like, oh my God. God. Because the breasts on Tom's screensaver, they weren't from any random woman or anything like that, any kind of picture you could find on the internet. No, because the breasts on his screensaver belonged to Jade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I know. Jade was now looking at a nude picture of herself, which was her stepdad's screensaver. Now she knew that the boobs on the screensaver were hers because she has a pretty unique beauty mark on one of her breasts. And the breasts on the screensaver had that beauty mark. So she knew 
that they were her boobs. And it's almost like time stood still, but also moved very quickly at the same time because she was like, how, how, how? How are my boobs on the screen right now? How does he have this picture? She couldn't make sense of what she was seeing. She just kept thinking, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. She thought she was losing her mind. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? And then after a few moments, Jade finally composed herself. She wanted to find out where the hell he had got on this photo from. Was there more? What is going on? So she decided the next best thing to do was to go through Tom's computer. She wanted to try and find the original photo. Where had he got it from? So Jade sits down at the desk and she starts going through the computer. She starts going through all of the files and what she would find would shatter her world even more more. Because she finally found the folder that contained the original picture of her breasts. But that wasn't the only photo of her that she found. There were hundreds, hundreds of nude photos of Jade on her stepdad's computer. Her stepdad that she had known since the age of 14. A fatherly figure in her life. Someone that she actually did refer to as dad. A person who she has said that she trusts more than anyone else in this world. Her stepdad has hundreds of nude photos of her. And these photos, they were just absolutely awful. There was photos of Jade's breasts. There were photos of Jade completely nude. There were photos of Jade engaging in sexual activity with previous boyfriends. There were photos of Jade in the shower smiling, photos that had been taken by previous ex-boyfriends. And these photos were organized into loads of different folders. There was a folder called Jade Shower. There was also a folder called Jade's Snatch, which is a very vulgar word for a woman's vagina. All of these folders were Jade's boobs, Jade doing this, Jade doing that. All of these photos were organized into their own folders. But what made this 10 times worse is that these photos, they were not just recent photos of Jade. These were photos that spanned pretty much Jade's whole life. There were photos of Jade in her 30s, in her mid 20s, in her early 20s, when she was living with Tom. Remember when she was living with Tom and her younger brother? That was in her early 20s. There were nude photos of her from then. But then what is just so disgusting is that there were also nude photos from when Jade was a minor. In some of the photos, Jade was only 16 years old and Jade was just sick to her stomach. She now felt like the relationship that she had with Tom, it was a complete sham. She felt used, manipulated, manipulated, violated and abused. And where did Tom get all of these photos from? That is what I want to know. Well, there are some conflicting sources on how he got these photos. However, it seems from a lot of things that I've read that Jade realized that a lot of these photos were stolen from her. So a lot of these photos that were on Tom's computer, she had taken herself or an ex-boyfriend had taken of her. So over the years, she had taken a number of nude photos and shared them with boyfriends. She had also taken videos and photos of her engaging in sexual activity and she stored all of these photos, videos, everything on an SD card and on a laptop. However, at some point, both her SD card and her laptop, they went missing. At the time, Jay didn't know what had happened to her laptop and her SD card. However, now she kind of thinks that Tom clearly stole them. But it's thought that that is not the only way that Tom got access to all of these photos. It's also thought that Tom could be accessing Jade's computer over the years. So clearly logging into her cloud account or something like that and secretly downloading all of these files for himself. And then to take it to another level, another creepy, disturbing level. Some sources also say that Tom set up hidden cameras and he took some of these photos using the hidden cameras and that is how some of the photos of when Jade was an older teenager from like 18 to 23 when she was living with Tom that is how some of these photos were taken and maybe this is also how he has nude photos of her when she is a minor and that cannot be 100% proven I just want to stress that but if that is true and Tom actually did set up hidden cameras to take nude photos of his 
his teenage stepdaughter. That is so, so disgusting and vile and just so sick. So after Jade made this discovery, she was completely broken. She just didn't know what to do because this man was like her father. Tom had been in her life for 25 years at this point and the whole time he had just been completely violating her. And as well, her mind started to wonder to what he was doing with those photos, what he was possibly doing when he was looking at those photos. And she was thinking, well, no wonder I'm not allowed in this office. And he had just been going into his office looking at these photos when she had been caring for him. So Jade went home. She didn't want to be in that office anymore. But when she got home, she wanted a shower because she just felt so disgusting. But she was scared to shower. She was scared to be naked. She was scared to be vulnerable. She didn't even want to touch her own skin. She actually vomited a few times because she just felt so violated and she really truly was sick to her stomach. So a couple of hours pass and she decides that she wants to talk to some friends. She wants to vent. She wants to ask them for advice. Like what is she supposed to do about this? So first she calls one of her good friends called Mike and she's like frantically saying, what do I do? What do I do? But Mike wasn't really much use. He basically basically just told her to go and delete the photos and move on. But Jade was actually scared of deleting the photos because if she deleted the photos, Tom would obviously find out that she knew about the photos. Now Jade was questioning everything because she was thinking to herself, well, if he is capable of all of this, of the nude photos, of taking photos of me and stealing them, if he is capable of that, what else could he be capable of? So she phones another friend called Sarah, again frantically on the phone, what do I do, what do I do? Now, Sarah was a little bit more helpful and Sarah came to the obvious conclusion of go to the police. However, Jade also didn't want to go to the police. She didn't quite know what the police could do. Could they even do anything? And again, going to the police, Tom would find out. And I've got to say, I think she should have gone to the police because this is a crime, especially if Tom had nude photos of a minor. That is 100% a crime. And I do think the police would take that very seriously. Um, but Jade is just not thinking like that. She doesn't think that they will take her seriously. So once again, Jade was left not really knowing what to do. And she was left home alone trying to figure out what to do in this completely unreal situation. So as she was trying to process what to do, Jade remembered something. Over the years, one of her very close friends called Sam had always told Jade about this one guy that they referred to as the fixer. And this guy, you could go to him, doesn't matter how big or small your problem was, he would fix it. And Jade remembered this. She remembered this fixer. So on the 23rd of December at 10.40 a.m., this is the same day that Jade has discovered the photos and we are only at 10.40 a.m. So at 10.40 a.m., Jade looks up The Fixer on Facebook. The Fixer, his real name is Alan Roach, by the way. And Alan worked in private security. So anyway, Jade messages him on Facebook and she just says, hi, I got your details from my friend Sam. And Alan, the fixer, he replies very quickly, is there something I can do for you? Which Jade goes on to kind of explain the situation. She says, I'm in a very awkward situation, can only talk about it in person. So Alan replies, okay, okay, calm down. I'm sure I can get this sorted for you. And then on the very same day, Alan goes over to visit Jade at her house. So when Alan goes over to the house, Jade explains the very complicated situation that she is in and that she desperately needs help. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know how to deal with this, but she's also incredibly scared of Tom. And Tom was currently in hospital, but he was only going to be in hospital for about another week. What was going to happen when he came home? She thought that it could turn violent with him and she needed help to deal with this. Now, Alan being an expert in private security, he was like, well, first thing we need to do is set up cameras around your house, which is exactly what he did. Alan also said that she should keep a weapon in her bedroom. So Jade actually started sleeping with a knife by her bed. And then Jade placed a large piece of blue tarp on her bedroom floor. And she actually started to sleep on this blue tarp. Because in Jade's mind, she thought that if someone broke into her home, 
i.e. Tom, and he came into the bedroom, he would walk on the top, he would make a lot of noise, and it would wake her up. Which, yeah, seems a bit strange to me, but that is what she was doing. And then once Alan had set up all of the security around the house and everything, Jade felt that she was ready to take a shower because she hadn't taken a shower. She didn't want to be vulnerable. She didn't want to take a shower. She didn't want to be naked. But she said that she only felt comfortable if Alan stood outside of the bathroom whilst she had a shower. And Alan did this and Jade had a shower and she was all good. She was all happy. And then Alan left. However, from this point going forward, Alan would go over to Jade's home every single day to stand outside of the bathroom whilst Jade had a shower, which seems pretty weird for uh, someone in private security to all of a sudden randomly do for somebody that they've just met. Now, there are rumours that Jade and Alan entered into a sexual relationship during this time. I don't know if that happened or not. Your guess is as good as mine, but that is what I read. And then the days pass and it's Christmas and then it all of a sudden is the 29th of December. And over that period of time from the 23rd of December to the 29th of December, Alan and Jade are messaging each other, texting one another about a plan this mystery plan that they need to decide on what to do. They were trying to text each other in very cryptic ways about this plan. Jade would say things like, hopefully we can figure out a plan. I imagine you're too busy to watch me shower every day. It's time to tighten up a plan. And the two of them were texting constantly. I'm talking about hundreds of messages were exchanged between the two of them over those few days. They would also call one another loads each day. And and they just kept talking about this plan. And then it was the 31st of December, which is the day that Tom was due to be discharged from the hospital. And this is the day that Jade would have to go pick him up from the hospital because that was what was arranged. And Jade would finally have to come face to face with her stepdad, who she was now so scared of, who had violated her for years. And Jade was panicking the day before. So the 30th of December, Jade kept sending Alan, the fixer, hundreds of texts saying things like, quote, my mind is spinning. I'm giving this some thought. I have an easy solution. She also sent another message to a friend saying, quote, I still struggle with moral issues, yet I will never not be looking over my shoulder. So I made the call. Now, what does she mean? I made the call. I have an easy solution. What does she mean by this? Well, whilst it cannot 100% be proven, all of these messages referring to the plan was that she wanted to murder her stepdad, Tom. That was the easy solution. After finding those photos and after her world just completely shattered and came crumbling down around her, Jay decided not to go to the police. She also decided not to confront Tom about this. She also decided to not publicly expose Tom for this. No, Jade jumped straight to murder. And this whole plot of murdering her stepdad, the whole plot, the mysterious plan between her and the fixer occurred within just seven days of her finding those photos. At this point, she had only known Alan, the fixer, for seven days and she was already planning on killing her stepdad with him. So now we get to the 31st of December 2020 and this is the day where the main events of today's case take place. So on this morning at 10.52 a.m. the first thing that Jay decides to do is to destroy all of the evidence of the photos on Tom's computer. But before she does this, she takes a few photos on her phone of the computer, of the photos on the computer, so she does have a little bit of evidence. But then following this, Jay just proceeds to destroy all of the photos. She deletes all of the photos and then she destroys the hard drive by pouring a bottle of Jack Daniels over it and then smashing it. And then at 11.19 a.m. on the 31st of December, 2020, Tom Merriman is discharged from hospital. And this is just eight days after Jade initially found the photos on his computer. So all of this is happening very fast. So Jade is there to meet Tom. She escorts him into her car. And I can't even imagine what would have been going through her head at that moment. Coming face to face with a man that you have trusted for so many years that has been violating you for all of those years. She doesn't confront Tom. She doesn't 
doesn't say anything to him. She just puts him in the car and proceeds to drive him home. But before they drive off, Tom hands Jade a big bag of medication because we know that he has so many health problems. He's on so much medication and this is filled with so much medication, half of it that I cannot pronounce, but it includes oxycodone and trazodone. But all of this is pretty significant, all of this medication, because then we get to 11.30 a.m. This is just 11 minutes after Tom has been discharged from the hospital. And this is when Jade sends a text message to Alan, the fixer, that said, quote, I just dosed the hell out of him. Yeah, those were her exact words. I just dosed the hell out of him. Clearly indicating that she has just pumped Tom full of drugs. All of the medication that he has just been prescribed, she has just pumped him full of it. And then following this, she sends another message to Alan the Fixer that says, quote, stopping at Dixie Line to stall, let me know. And Dixie Line is a hardware store from my understanding. And when she went into Dixie Line, she bought zip ties, towels, and two pairs of gloves. Now, what does that sound like she's planning to do? Mm -hmm, yeah. And then she obviously said to Alan the Fixer, let me know, stalling, going to Dixie Line, let me know. Also clearly indicating that Alan the Fixer should let her know when he is ready to take part in whatever plan they have. So Jay drives around for a while and she's waiting for a text off Alan to say that he is ready. However, Jay just keeps driving around and he doesn't text her back. And Jade is getting really, really frustrated. So because she has Tom in the back of her car and Tom is clearly dosed up, like she has said, so I assume he's probably passed out, Jade starts to think, okay, I'm gonna need to make plan B. So she decides to head home instead. However, this is when her next problem occurs because she is trying to get the dosed up Tom out of her car, but she can't do it. And he just collapses in the driveway. So now there is a dosed up Tom just collapsed in the middle of the driveway. And this is when Jade goes into full panic mode. She starts sending a flurry of text messages to Alan the Fixer, saying things like, he fell in the driveway. I can't carry him into the house. I can't carry him back to the car. I'm not strong enough. He's just stuck there. Can you come right away? What do I do? But Alan the Fixer, he ghosts her. He's not saying anything. So once again, Jade is forced to change another plan because right now she needs to get Tom out of the driveway. So this is when she texts her ex-boyfriend, Adam. He is the one that she went to Mexico with. Now Jade has texted Adam and she says, my stepdad is in the drive, passed out drunk. It's an emergency, can you come quickly? But Adam just responds and says, oh no, sorry, I'm getting a tattoo, can't help you. So Jade is forced to text another one of her friends, a person called Charles, but he also can't help. He is in the middle of the desert doing God knows what. So now she texts another one of her friends, a woman called Sarah, and Sarah was one of the people that Jade asked for help when she first discovered the photos. So she messages Sarah and says, quote, he is alive. Please don't ask me any questions. Just help me get him into the house, which sounds dodgy as hell. Who the hell starts a message off? He is alive. Please don't ask me any questions. How? dodgy does that sound. But anyway, Sarah agrees to go over to help her. Apparently she doesn't ask any questions. So now it is 1 p.m., which is 90 minutes approximately after Jade picked up Tom and after she dosed him up in the car. And this is when Sarah and her boyfriend, Justin, finally arrive to help out Jade. Together, they all lift Tom and place Tom back in Jade's car. And Jade just explains the situation oh, he's drunk, he's passed out, I need to get him back in the car and I'm taking him back to the hospital. And then Jade drives off, pretending to go back to the hospital. And Sarah and Justin, they leave. They don't have a clue what is going on. They're just like, this is a bit weird. Jade now sends another flurry of messages to Alan, the fixer. She is getting so frustrated with Alan because the whole morning he has not texted her back. 
He is supposed to be her accomplice in this whole plan and he has not messaged her back. So Jade is just driving around sending all of these messages to Alan and she says to Alan, I had to call someone to help me carry him inside. I wish you were closer. She also said, quote, he's waking up. I really didn't want to be the one to do this, which again sounds suspicious as hell because that sounds to me that Jade is saying, I didn't want to be the one to murder him. I don't know. That is how I'm reading that. Again, Alan doesn't text her back. So she's driving around for a little bit longer, waiting for Alan to text her back, but he doesn't. So she drives back home and this is now 2.30 p.m., which is 90 minutes after Sarah and Justin helped get Tom back in the car. But now this is a full three hours since Jade picked up Tom from the hospital and dosed him up. But now after the three hours, Alan the fixer finally responds. Alan said that he was too busy. He couldn't deal with her problems today and he would get his business partner to come and help her. And it's like, business partner? How many people work for this hitman company? Oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't call it a hitman company because it hasn't been proven to be a hitman business. And Jade is not happy about this. Jade responds, Hell no. I'm super uncomfortable having anyone else involved. However, Alan texts back and says, it's too late. I've already contacted my business partner. He's on the way. Just give him some money and he'll be there soon. So Jade feels like she has no other option but to wait for this business partner to show up. So 30 minutes go by and the business partner still hasn't showed up. Jade sends a load more angry messages to Alan saying, he is waking up. I'm not sure how much longer I can control my temper. I asked you for help. I tried to do it on my own. I need your help and I'm waiting on a stranger. She also adds, how soon will you get here? It's going to be weekend at Bernie's up in here. Now, this is pretty significant. I have never seen Weekend at Bernie's. Maybe I need to, but I read online like the brief summary of what the film is about. But basically the movie is about two men that arrive at their boss's house for the weekend, Weekend at Bernie's, and they find their boss dead. And they're worried that the murder or the death will get pinned on them. So they go around the whole weekend pretending that he's still alive. So yeah, that is pretty suspicious, isn't it? That she said, oh, it's going to be weekend at Bernie's up in here. Finally, it's now 3.30 p.m. And the business partner, a man called Brian Solomon, finally turns up. And when Brian arrives, Jade is pretty frantically telling him what has happened. She says, I've drugged him. He's on the back seat of the car. But Brian doesn't really know what she's talking about. He's like, sorry, what? What do you mean? There is a person drugged in your car? Like, what are you talking about here? Because Alan the Fixer, his business partner, had given him no information. All he was told is that a woman called Jade needed his assistance. So Brian was like, so what do you want me to do? Like, what is it exactly that you need? And Jade just calmly says, I want you to strangle him. I'll take care of the rest. And then she also adds, oh, there's some rope in the car that you can use. And Brian was like, sorry, what? You want me to strangle somebody? Because it turns out that Brian wasn't a hitman. Jade had expected a hitman to be showing up. And that was not Brian. So Brian just says to Jade, I just need to talk to Alan for a second. Please excuse me. So Brian goes to make a call to Alan outside, but he actually just runs off. He's like, I'm out of here. I'm out. I'm not doing this. Brian thought that he was just at Jade's house as a good deed to just help somebody out. He had no idea what he was walking into. But does he go to the police, which is possibly what he should have done? No, no. No, he doesn't. So the big plan, even though they had been planning this for like several days now, it was not going to plan, was it? Alan was a no-show. He was just ghosting her. He was not being helpful at all. And he was definitely not fixing anything. Her ex-boyfriend, Adam, is too busy getting a tattoo to even bother to turn up to help her. I mean, Adam doesn't actually have a clue what is going on. And then Brian, the business partner, has just run off. So then at 4 p.m., Jade sends a load more text to Alan saying, what the hell happened to Brian? Where did he go? I asked for your help. I can't do it alone. He is waking up and getting way more aggressive. I can't keep a kicking body in my trunk. 
I'm about ready to club him, which again does not look good, does it? So now Tom is in the trunk of her car and I honestly don't know how he got there. But even though Jade is texting Alan, Alan is ghosting her again. So Jade texts her ex-boyfriend Adam again in desperation, but he is still getting a tattoo. And then 6 p.m. rolls around. This is two hours after Brian, the business partner, ran away. And Alan, the fixer, finally responds and says, sorry, I've got family stuff I'm dealing with. I have a better idea, but it can't be taken care of tonight. Can't afford a messy job site. Again, incredibly suspicious. They are clearly talking about a murder and they really do think that they are being so intelligent by saying things like, messy job site, can't afford that. So once again, Jade is left completely on her own because Alan is busy with family stuff. However, it is now 7.30 p.m., eight hours after Jade initially picked up Tom from the hospital and dosed the hell out of him. And Tom is still in the trunk of her car. And this is when Adam, Jade's ex, finally shows up. Yeah, he's finally finished getting a tattoo. And when Adam gets to the house, Jade is absolutely distraught. She is frantic, she is panicking, and Adam had no idea what he was walking into. And this is when the huge revelation comes out. Because in the last few hours, whilst Tom is stuck in the trunk of the car, Alan was ghosting her, he was a no-show, he was not helping, the business partner was also not helping. Jade was completely on her own. And Jay decided that she had to take matters into her own hands. And when Adam finally showed up, Jade was just having a complete mental breakdown because of what she had just done. So when Adam walks in to Jade, Jade just tells him everything. Jade tells Adam all about the explicit photos on Tom's computer, about Alan the Fixer, about the whole plan. And this is also when Jade said to Adam, quote, I killed him. Yes, I drugged him, but he wasn't dying fast enough. So I put a plastic bag over his head. I choked him and I strangled him. And Adam was just stood there in complete shock. He was like, am I hearing this right? Has she just confessed to a murder? And Adam immediately started panicking because he was like, oh my God, I am at a murder scene. And he immediately starts wiping down any surfaces, anything that he has touched. And this is when Jade says to Adam, I need your help moving his body from the car to his bed. I want to stage it so it looks like an overdose. And Adam was thinking, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. And he just ran out of there. And in my opinion, this is what the original plan was. Pick Tom up from the hospital, drug him up with the various medications that he had, place him in his own bed and make it look like an overdose. And I think they really thought that they were going to get away with this because Tom had had problems with drug addictions and alcohol addictions. So I don't think it would be too far-fetched for people to think, oh, he's just overdosed. And this case has just been one massive roller coaster. Like it really has. I cannot believe how quickly everything has escalated. It it literally was only eight days ago that Jade initially found those nude photos of herself on his computer. And now all of a sudden she's murdered Tom. And now Jade has just admitted to Adam that she has murdered Tom. And Tom's body is still in the trunk, by the way. And Jade has no idea what she's going to do next. And this is when everything would start to come crashing down around Jade. Because after Adam fled, Jade was sending more messages to Alan saying things things like, am I in this alone? I only have hours until bruising shows. Need to get him inside. Need to figure out my issue. This does not end well for me. And meanwhile, Adam has just left Jade's house. He actually goes straight to a New Year's Eve party because remember, all of this is happening on New Year's Eve. Adam actually confessed to someone at the party about what Jade had done. And the whole time Adam was at this party, he kept thinking over and over again, what should he do? Should he go to the police? What is the right thing to do? And then finally at 9.30 a.m. on New Year's Day, Adam dials 911 to report what Jade has done. So it is now New Year's Day. Jade is still texting Alan the Fixer constantly. She messages him over and over again, 
please help me. I need help. I just need to get him inside. Plan B does not end well for me. But again, Alan just keeps ignoring her. Jade also messaged a number of friends on New Year's Day asking for help but no one responded to her. And then later on that day, around 5 p.m., Jade received a phone call from Tom's brother saying that detectives were looking for Tom. And Jade was like, oh crap, they're on to me. Jade continued to text Alan the fixer saying, I really need to clear the trash in my driveway. If anyone knows, this place could be swarming. I have a pile of trash I really need to get rid of. Can you send someone? But did Alan send someone? No. And at 5.30 p.m., Jade sent one last message to Alan the Fixer, which simply read, quote, lose my number, I'm getting pulled over. Because this was indeed when Jade Janks was being pulled over by the police. And this was the very moment that she was arrested. So following this, Jade was taken down to the police station for questioning, but Jade was not saying a single word. She refused to answer any questions and she just kept asking repeatedly for an attorney. Jade was held overnight and detectives got to work trying to find out what had happened. Like, where was Tom? Like, was he murdered? Like, what is going on? So detectives started by searching Jade's home, Tom's home, Jade's car, but Tom was nowhere to be seen. However, at 7 a.m. on the 2nd of January, detectives were doing a more thorough search on the outside of Tom's home. And on his driveway was a large pile of trash, which initially they had just kind of ignored because it just looked like trash. However, they looked through this trash and buried underneath it was none other than Tom Merriman's body. At some point, Jade had clearly moved Tom's body from the trunk of her car onto Tom's driveway and just buried him in trash. And that is why she kept messaging Alan the fixer, oh, I have trash in the driveway that needs to be moved. Someone needs to come and pick up the trash in the driveway. So the fact that they had found Tom's body and they had testimony from Adam, who she had obviously confessed to, Jade was charged with first first degree murder and her bail was set at one million dollars. Jade easily paid. So now she was released on bail awaiting trial. So then nearly two whole years passed because we go from January of 2021 all the way to December of 2022. And for those two years that Jade was out, she was just living at her biological dad's house and she was continuing on with her business, her interior designs. She was still posting on social media, promoting her business. People were actually worried that she was going to flee to South Africa at one point because that is where her dad, her biological dad is originally from and he has connections over there, but she never did. And then in December of 2022, this is when the trial finally started and Jade pleaded not guilty. She said that she did not murder Tom, that he really did just take an overdose. And I don't know how she was trying to explain the fact that he just ended up under trash in the driveway. Like, how do you explain that? But anyway, that is the story that she was going with. However, the prosecution put forward all of the evidence and the most damning pieces of evidence was all of the text messages between Jade and Alan the Fixer. There was actually 70 pages of text messages between the two of them. There was a lot of messages, way more than I have read out in this video. Adam, the ex-boyfriend, was also called to the stand to give evidence because obviously she had confessed to him. They also called Brian, the business partner, to testify because obviously she had asked Brian to strangle Tom. She had asked Brian to murder Tom for her. And then you're probably thinking, okay, so where is Alan the fixer? Surely he was also called to give evidence. Surely he was also charged with something. Conspiracy to murder, maybe. But no, I haven't got a clue where Alan the fixer is. He is a mystery man. Alan the fixer is completely MIA. I don't have a clue who he is. And then in the trial, Jade decided to take the stand for herself and give evidence which is never a good idea. So when she's on the stand, she starts off by going through like her relationship with Tom, all the background and stuff. There's always been a really special bond. Um, I've never, I don't think I've ever gotten along with anybody as well. I don't think I've ever trusted anybody as much. Um, or being able to just be as, 
and say open and vulnerable. And then she talks about the moment that she found the nude photos of herself on his computer. And she breaks down, she starts crying. I went to clean um, in his office area. I was kind of wiping things down and um, I bumped the mouse on his desktop computer and it, it shook the screen awake. And I looked and there's a picture of female breasts on the screen. And I look at that. Um, I have a beauty mark kind of on my chest, and I look at it, I thought, those, those are my breasts, so... It was the most violating, just awful, gut-wrenching feeling ever. I felt, I felt sick, I, I felt... I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I couldn't even touch my own skin. Um, I don't even know if there's words. I mean, not even in a movie have I seen something so just sick. And Jade also tries to explain the text messages and she just says that they have been completely taken out of context and that the so-called mystery plan that she was talking about is that Jade and Alan the Fixer, all they were planning to do was confront Tom about the photos, get him to delete the photos and then force him to leave his home, move away so he's nowhere near Jade. However, the prosecution were like, that just doesn't add up. And what was a real damning piece of evidence against Jade is that she deleted the nude photos of herself before she picked up Tom from the hospital. So if her plan was to confront Tom and get him to delete the photos and make sure that he deletes all of the photos and all of the possible copies that he has, why did she delete them before she picked up Tom from the hospital? It just doesn't make sense because it's not true. And Jade also accused Brian and Adam of both lying. They're both completely lying. Yep. Yeah. Everyone else is lying. Jade is the only only one telling the truth. And there was an autopsy done on Tom's body and there was no evidence of strangulation. Tom's cause of death was listed as drug poisoning. However, I have read, and this may be wrong, that if a person is intoxicated like Tom was, it takes barely any pressure to suffocate them because they're not fighting back. They are completely intoxicated. And because it takes barely any pressure, there would be no damage to the neck. There would be no bruising and it would unlikely show up on an autopsy. So I'm just saying that is still a possibility just because there was no evidence of strangulation. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So the jury went off to deliberate and the jury came back and they found Jay Janks guilty of first degree murder and there is footage of when she found out that she was found guilty and she looks so shocked. We the jury in the above entitled cause find the defendant Jade Sasha Jenks guilty of the crime of murder in violation of penal code section 187 subsection a a felony as charged in count one of the amended information and fix the degree thereof as murder in the first degree dated today's date sign the foreperson and then on the 6th of March of 2023, Jay Janks was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. So that was the case of Jade Janks. And I'm sure you can all understand why this case divides opinions. And I want to hear your opinions in the comments down below, because you have some people that think what Jay did was completely wrong. She shouldn't murder somebody, even though there was these nude photos of her on her stepdad's computer. Computer, Tom didn't deserve to be murdered. And Jade should have gone to the police. She should not have taken the law into her own hands. But then you've got other people that think, well, good for her. Tom had violated her. This is sexual assault. Tom is not innocent himself. I'm definitely on the side of she should have gone to the police. Even though what Tom did was absolutely disgusting. Like, oh my God, I can't even imagine the hurt that she went through. But the police would have done something because there were nude images of a minor on his computer. That is a criminal offence. But in the aftermath of this case, Jade and her legal team have appealed the decision. But because the trial has literally only just happened, the appeal is still ongoing. So I don't know the outcome of that. So we will just have to wait and see what happens. And then following his murder, Tom Merriman was buried by his family. And after the trial, his brother went on to say, quote, we are deeply saddened 
at the loss of Tom. He was taken far too soon from us. He was a great father, son, brother, and friend. He was compassionate, caring, generous, kind, and selfless. We will do our best to remember him for his genius talent to grow and nurture living things. And that brings us to the end of today's case. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. I really want to know them on today's case. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Love and Pies for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can download the game using the link below in the description box. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.